Okay, guys, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we have a special guest, Nick Shaw, uh, the founder of uh, RP Strength. Uh, I'm going to have Coach Mike actually do a better introduction for him because Coach Mike has uh, been through their program, has done the uh, nutrition program, is now a nutritionist for our coaches, and or not for our coaches, but our athletes. So, uh, Mike, if you want to introduce and we'll go from there. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm pretty pumped to have uh, Nick on tonight. Uh, so I found RP probably three or four years ago. Um, and one of the things that really stood out to me over everything else uh, in this space is just how RP is rooted in like this scientific approach to diet. And uh, in, a, in a world where obviously fad, fad diets live and quick fixes live, like RP is very much like, you know, consistency and um long term like periodization and stuff like that which really aligns with like what we teach as endurance coaches right like we try to periodize your training and stuff like that so uh I got to know RP throughout the last couple of years you know a lot of their stuff and then I actually had the chance to meet and talk with Nick uh back in December spent some time with them at the RP summit in Vegas which was really cool and again it just reaffirmed my belief with with this company and so as I as we got to going with uh you know getting you know, nutrition involved with NVDM coaching, I said, Hey, we gotta, we gotta partner with RP strength. Cause I think, you know, their principles, their philosophies align with like what we're, we're trying to do. Um, and so if you would ask me four, three or four years ago that we would have Nick on a team call, I would have told you you're lying. And the fact that we have him here tonight is incredible. So, uh, I will let Nick talk a little bit about how he started the company and, and why and stuff like that. But, uh, just know that this is really, really cool that we have him on. So Nick, do you just want to like give a little bit about, you know, RP and the the quick history of it and how you've got to this point? That'd be cool. Yeah. Hey, uh, thanks everyone for having me on. Appreciate it. Uh, happy Easter. Uh, so RP, we've been around for about 10, a little over 10 years now. We just had our 10 year anniversary last year. Uh, RP stands for Renaissance Periodization, a uh, really, really long name. Uh, when my buddy, uh, Dr. Mike Isertel and, and I started the company, we had no grand illusions that it would become uh, somewhat of a bigger company and hence the kind of weird, weird name. But, uh, you know, here we are, we started as personal trainers in New York City. Uh, that was a lot of fun. We then started doing online coaching uh, about a decade ago. And we were kind of early on, I would say, is to, you know, online coaching. And, you know, nowadays it's much, much more prevalent, especially after COVID, which is really cool to see, um, especially when folks are, you know, well-educated and, and things like that. Uh, hopefully that's becoming more of the norm. But uh, we, so we did that and we started to um, recruit other coaches because we simply couldn't keep up ourselves. And then we had this crazy idea to do some like digital products. And we thought we had like a pretty cool process behind everything uh, being very evidence-based. And so we created an ebook and that did really, really well. That came out in 2014. And we thought, well, gee whiz, maybe we're onto something here. And so we thought, well, we kind of know how to do the nutrition coaching model one-on-one -on -one for people. And again, we started more on like the bodybuilding powerlifting side of things. That's a bit more of my background. Um, funny enough, I actually do way back in high school. My my true background is actually a little bit more in endurance. I was a cross country runner and uh, track and field in high school. So kind of had that competitive uh, fire early on and it switched from that to a bit more on the, the lifting side. Because uh, I was always, when I was a runner in high school, I was always like the biggest runner because I really like lifting weights too. So it was always weird. And I just kind of shifted more into lifting and it's, I, I just love training. I love everything about it. So um, long story short, we did the di digital product route, uh, got a little bit more into the app space a little over four years ago, and that's kind of where we're at now. And I guess our whole approach has always been like, how do we take the the our system or approach, which is just evidence-based, I wouldn't really call it like our approach, so to speak. It's really just where does the evidence tend to point us? Because we've all probably heard all sorts of weird, crazy nutrition things out there. I can't eat this, can't eat that. It can really be a little confusing and overwhelming. And we just thought, you know, hey, we've got, now we've got a team of, you know, I think we've got about 25 coaches, something like 20 of them are PhDs, five or six are registered dietitians, a couple are PhDs and RDs. And so we just want to help, you know, bring, I guess the, a more evidence-based approach to it and make making sure people are spending their time doing the things that actually work versus doing things that maybe don't work so well. That's probably the best way, you know, too long didn't read TLDR version of uh, how RP started and where we're at today. So 
Yeah. It, it was kind of my understanding, feel free to like fire questions or if you want to kind of lead the way as like, hey, can you talk about this next? But um, that's a little bit about how RP started, probably what sets us apart a little bit with like 20 PhDs, you know, having the RDs on staff. And then I was going to talk just briefly about our app and kind of that like transition because we started out with um, Excel templates, actually, that when we first came out with them in 2015. Uh, later got to PDFs. We we you know stepped up our game a little bit, so to speak. And then now with an app that's sold through the app stores and whatnot, it uh, the best way to describe it is most people are already familiar with My Fitness Pal, and My Fitness Pal is a great tool, uh, but it's a tracker, and so people can just literally log whatever they're eating. It doesn't really give them guidance as to hey, what should I eat. When should I eat it based around my training? I don't need to tell all you folks, but it can make a big difference what you eat around your training. And so it just was kind of missing that. And what we want to do is come in and yeah, you can still kind of track things, but we want to break things down on a meal by meal basis, telling people exactly how much food they need to eat at every single meal. And not only that, but like it's pretty flexible. You can move some stuff around. You can move macros from different meals, but you program in your height, your weight, your sex, your activity levels. Um, you know, how long you're training, all that stuff. And then it, based on that, calculates what you do. And then along the way, it gives you, well, actually you give it, you give it your feedback, which is like your body weight and some other things. And then it adjusts on the fly each week for you. So if you're, you know, trying to lose X amount of weight, it's going to give you a predicted line of what that should look like. And you chart your body weight along the way. And then based on where you're at, it's going to each week suggest recommendations to your plan. So if you're ahead of schedule, it might say, hey, you can probably actually eat a little bit more. Do you want to do that? Or if you're behind schedule, it might say, hey, it, you know, it's actually time to probably reduce your nutrients a little bit, as much as that sucks. But, and then obviously the, the user has the ability to override that or, or agree with it if they want. And so it's pretty much like having a one-on-one -on -one coach, but for, you know, a fraction of the cost. And that's really what we were trying to do. Like when we first started RP and we did the templates, we thought, well, when we were in college and we couldn't afford one-on-one -on -one coaching because, you know, we were poor college students, of course, could we have paid for something like that? You know, templates that cost $100, you can use them for, you know, three, six months, if not longer. Or could we pay, you know, 15, 20 bucks a month for an app? Probably for a little bit, you know, for a short period of time or something like that. And so that's uh, essentially what we wanted to do, make nutrition coaching or, yeah, basically that process affordable for everyone if they wanted to use it, especially in like this more sport performance realm. So that's kind of what uh, makes our app different from a lot of the trackers out there. Yeah, I was going to say too, the the app uh, kind of leading into like the benefits of RP. I touched on it a little bit in the the intro, like the periodization aspect, right? And one of the things I love about the app is like when you set it up, right? It asks you, you know, like it, it puts you into a, let's say either a diet phase or a muscle gain phase, right? And it sets a timeline for you, right? Because I think that's the one thing that a lot of people... Uh, when they start looking at uh, body composition changes, right? They think, okay, well, here's my goal weight and I'm just going to work to get to that goal weight no matter how long it takes, right? So I'm either going to be in a perpetual diet or perpetual gain for uh, longer than you should be, right? And so that's, I, you know, with the app, I think uh, benefits of RP, just that you talk a little bit about that periodization mindset mm -hmm. of like, you know, hey, we're going to do this. This is for a finite amount of time. And then if we want to reach a goal that expands outside, maybe that eight to 12 week window, how you would approach, uh, you know, maintenance and then another diet phase or something like that. Yeah, yeah, totally. So we usually recommend things in, I would say like eight to 12 week blocks for the most part, uh, just because you get diminishing returns after that. And it sort of goes both ways if you're trying to lose weight or gain weight. So what happens if you're trying to gain weight too long is, you tend to gain just a little bit more fat than than lean tissue. And normally that's not a great outcome for, for athletes. And then on the flip side, if you're trying to lose weight, so 12 weeks is usually about the, the max we go. Obviously there's exceptions to all these rules, of course, but uh, just speaking in more generalization here, um, psychologically, it becomes a, a really big hurdle for a lot of people because dieting is uh, mentally fatiguing. And so as you as you have to kind of slowly reduce your calories along the way, you can get to a point where your caloric level becomes so low that one, performance is going to drop, or two, you just start to kind of feel like crap. And we really don't want people to do that, uh, you know, unless you are like a, a crazy, you know, physique athlete um, like myself, but I know I'm crazy. So actually, you know what? No, no, no. 
Well, you guys are endurance folks. You're just as crazy. It's just kind of a different, different ends of the same spectrum. So I think we can all relate to that. Um, but that's usually why, because if you go too much longer than three months, it just gets really, really hard. And a lot of times you just get those diminishing returns. It's just not worth it. Like, could you? Yeah, you probably go up to like four months, maybe. Um, way back in the day, I remember trying to do like a five month diet and it just gets so miserable at the end that you know, you live and learn and certainly we wouldn't recommend that. So that's kind of why it's based on like eight or 12. So like in the app, you program it in there and there's obviously constraints in there because someone can't say, hey, I want to lose 50 pounds in the next four weeks. Like, you know, you can't do stuff like that. So if someone wanted to lose a lot of weight over time, traditionally what we like to do is, well, let's chunk that up. So let's go, all right, let's lose 20 pounds over the next three, you know, three months, 12 weeks. That's a really good outcome. And then after that, what we want to do is we want to switch to maintenance. And maintenance just means your calories in, calories out are pretty much even. So you lose those 20 pounds. And then your goal is to pretty much just maintain that for about the same amount of time as you were dieting. Gives your, your body, your metabolism time to you know come back to life, so to speak, the easiest way to describe that. And then you just get a big psychological break too. You get to eat some more fun food. You get to have a little bit more flexibility and freedom. Do that for a while. And then you could do another diet, You know, lose another 20 pounds and well, you know, nine months later, you're down 40 pounds and you're literally a different person. So that's sort of how we like to break things down rather than just trying to do it all in one diet, because then you start to hit those diminishing returns. And a lot of times people will, you know, burn out and just completely backtrack and fall off the wagon. One of the things that uh, we talk a lot about too is nutritional priorities, right? And, uh, you know, I think in this space, there's so much emphasis put on maybe some priorities that are kind of in that like 1%, right? Like the 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 1% of the 1% that people spend want to spend a lot of money on because it's the quick fix or uh, whatever. And I'm going to drop the uh, the RP pyramid in the chat, uh, just so everybody can get a picture of this. But um, I think this is a great representation of like the priorities people should have when it comes to nutrition, right? Um, and this can kind of lead us into that nutritional mindset, but talk a little bit about like the, the nutritional priorities and like how you guys approach uh, those with RP. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I saw there's a couple of questions there. Do you, you want to just like kind of save those for- Yeah, for we can, we'll, let's save those to the end. We'll kind of collect them and then we'll kind of rapid fire them at the end. Perfect. Yeah, so what we like to do is break everything down into what really matters the most versus what matters a little bit less and less. And so if you look at that chart, we used to not have adherence on it at all when we first came out with our first ebook. And it seemed like, uh, kind of like Mike had said, people would get so caught up in some of the minutia that they were really missing the big picture. And like they would get so caught up in having to have the perfect supplements or having to have you know the perfect food quality or the, the exact timing of meals. And they would get so caught up on that that sometimes they would just not even be able to stick to the diet because they were trying to be too perfect with it. So we thought, well, we kind of have to make that so clear that there's no argument, no way around it. Just like if you're not getting in all of your workouts, you wouldn't expect to get the same outcomes. Adherence is important, whether it's nutrition, whether it's training, it's, there's no better way to say it. You can't skip it or, you know, half-ass it. So, you just, you're just not going to get anywhere. So you have to have that. And then on the flip side, we start to work up uh, the other side of the, of the pyramid and calorie balance is the most important. So if you're trying to lose weight, trying to gain weight, there's no way around it. You have to account for it. It's like the engine to your car without it. You're not going anywhere. So what we like to do, if you just track your body weight a couple times a week, it doesn't have to be every day. You don't have to be super crazy or anything like that couple times a week, just see where things are trending. Because if you're trying to lose weight and that scale is just staying the same, again, the reason that I say we like to use weekly uh, averages because there's going to be a lot of fluctuations. If you have really hard training, you have hormonal water weight fluctuations, you know, you have Easter today and, you know, you're at your family's eating all sorts of food and all those goodies, like guess what? Your body weight's going to be up tomorrow. You know, no big deal. So we like to take weekly averages. And especially for females, I'd probably say take even more like two weeks because one week, you know, can have some crazy spikes up and down. So if you're not really seeing some movement over the course of like two weeks, that's when you know you'd probably need to adjust that calorie balance. So one way to do that is um, manipulating your food intake up or down, whichever way you need to go, and then uh, increasing your activity levels, which interestingly enough, I don't really have to say too much more on this call because you folks 
train a ton. So that's not really a concern. But for most folks that aren't training multiple hours a day, you know, maybe they get to the gym for an hour a day, something like that. Like we work with a lot of folks that do CrossFit. They go to the gym like one hour a day. They're in, they're out. Like that's totally cool. But just imagine someone that's not really training at all you know, pretty sedentary lifestyle. Well, for them, it may just be as easy as how do we sort of get that, uh, the the calorie balance to shift in our favor if they're trying to lose weight. They just start moving more. They they maybe get a step counter and they just monitor that. It can be as something as easy as that. And for a lot of folks, you know, you tell them to go for a walk with their family or their, their dog or whatever. Usually that's easier than um, eating less to start out because it's just, it's something that you know, pretty much anyone can do. So that's uh, calorie balance. We say it's about 50% of your diet success. So it's pretty important. Beyond that, you start to go up the scale a little bit for carbohydrates. I'm sorry, macronutrients. Macronutrients is number two. Um, carbohydrates plays a big role in that. Usually, that's typically the one that gets uh, the most uh, vilified. And so it actually ranks in our macronutrients. We have protein, carbs, and fats. So we usually like to start with protein as probably being the most important just to help you maintain all of your lean tissue for athletic performance and all that good stuff, uh, then carbohydrates. So this is the one that's going to have the most variability too, because if you folks are doing a, you know, how, what's like a, what's like a long workout for, for you folks. Uh, normally I would say like three to four hours, but that's like, that's like in the CrossFit realm and they're like three to four hours is like pretty long time, but I, for you yeah, folks we, that. We've got a couple getting ready for Ironman Texas in a couple of weeks. And I know that the bike ride yesterday was five to six hours. Um, so, I mean, it was a good, it's a good chunk of time out there. That's a lot. That's a lot of activity. That's a lot of um, calories being burned. And the cool thing is the caloric needs are sky high. And so it just gives so much more flexibility on all of this. And, you know, you think about it from this way. If someone's a sedentary person, their carbon take is probably down here. I guess it should be pretty low because they don't really have huge energy demand. I have the six hours of training a day you know, gee whiz, that's way up here. And so that's why carbs have so much variability along the way. I mean, if you're in five, six hour ride, something like that, you could easily be at like three, four times your body weight in terms of carbohydrates. And that's not out of the realm of, you know, that's not abnormal. So, you know, you can imagine, let's say if you're a 150 pound person, well, you know, 600 grams of carbs is pretty, pretty good amount. It's, at the top of a mass phase, I weigh like 225. I would consider that a pretty good day for me. So for a 150 pound person, that's a lot. And so sometimes you just get a lot more flexibility because it can be pretty tough. Now, again, some of this is when you're riding, you're consuming a lot of, um, you know, sports drink, et cetera, to get in a lot of those carbohydrates, because otherwise it's just really hard to get in all that food intake. So that's why I say there's a bit more flexibility around that. And then the third macronutrient is uh, fats. And so we usually like to just call those our filler calories. So if you know how much protein you need, you know how much carbs you need, you generally know your caloric needs to maintain at a given weight, your fats just fill in the rest. And so for endurance folks, carbs tend to be pretty dang high. You've, so, got, a, you've got a great podcast episode with uh, Alex Harrison that came out uh, about a month ago, and I'll link it in the, in the chat here. But um, we've had Alex on the call before, and I know we'll have him on again in, a, in the next couple of weeks at some point. But uh, I think for those listening, if you want to dive a little bit deeper into like the carbohydrate needs for endurance athletes, that's a great podcast to go listen to with Nick and, and Alex, because they get really deep into the weeds on some of that stuff. 100%. And that's like, it, it starts very quickly get beyond my area of expertise. So I would recommend Alex. And I mean, some of the stuff he said just kind of blows my mind when you think about it, because I mean, I've. I've been as, as heavy as like 250 plus, And I just, even some of the amounts he was throwing out, I was just like, ah, it's, it's, it's wild, wild in a good way, of course. So uh, <clears throat> macronutrient breakdown about 30%. So between calorie balance and macronutrients, you're about 80% of your diet success right there in terms of altering your body composition and uh, fueling for performance. So those are the two main ones by far and away. So what would happen in sort of the reason that we laid things out in a priority list is a lot of times people get so caught up in the timing, in the supplements, et cetera, that they wouldn't focus on those first two. And we're like, eh, just it's really backwards. It's like, you know, a 16 year old kid that just starts lifting for the first time and he walks into GNC and he's like, hey, like, what are the perfect supplements? It's like, that's not really the right 
question to be asking. And so, well, how are you going to go train pretty hard for like five years or so and then come back? Or I mean, not you can obviously use supplements along the way, but um, you know, some people just like to get a little bit too caught up in some of the minutia there. So after that, then we have nutrient timing, which is a really interesting one, um, especially as you get more advanced and you start dealing with higher level athletes, because you can really start to dial things in a lot more. So if you're working with folks that are doing really long workouts, you absolutely you know, need more fluids, you need more carbohydrates, all that around those really long workouts. Again, I would just sec- uh, recommend going to that podcast and you know, Dr. Alex Erickson really dives in in a, in a pretty cool way there. Um, cause a lot of times when I give these talks, it's more to, I don't want to say general population folks, cause that's not accurate, but, um, usually people that only work out for an hour or two. So usually we say, if you're only working out for an hour or under like supplementing with carbohydrates, you know, during your training, it's not really even that important in the grand scheme of things. So you almost don't even have to do it. I like to do it. I usually train for about an hour, hour and a half with weights, you know, six times a week. Um, I've just been doing it for so long. I really am really like it but like you certainly don't have to if you're not training that long usually when you start getting up to you know hour and a half two hour workouts and plus is when that becomes quite a bit more important than when you need to start supplementing more or if you have people that are training multiple times a day so if you have someone that you know is practicing in the morning and then they lift weights later or vice versa it becomes a little bit more important and you want some of the higher gi carbs so just think i mean sports drink is is the best example that i'm sure most people are familiar with and it just gets into your system quicker. It replenishes your glycogen, so you're ready for the next session, practice, whatever it is. Um, so that's one part of nutrient timing. The other is just meal frequency, which by and large, if you're eating like every few hours while you're awake, beyond that, you don't really have to worry about it too much. And some of that will depend on how you shift things. If you're training earlier in the day versus if you're training later, you can kind of shift things around. Um, by and large, you just want more carbohydrates around your workout window. So if your long ride is in the morning, you know, first thing, you're probably going to want to get some carbs in your system before you get going, take a bunch with you to consume, or that can be either gels or liquids, probably just a personal preference there. Um, I think Alex briefly touches on some funny stories of, of folks you, you probably don't want to if you have a race, like don't experiment with new stuff. You kind of want to probably ease into some of that stuff. As I, I, again, I'm preaching to the choir here, I'm sure. But that again, nutrient time is about 10% of your diet success. So it's not it's not all that important if you're getting in the total amounts. But if you've ever been on a longer ride and didn't maybe have the right amounts, you might notice as the workouts progress, you'll start to tailor off and performance will start to suffer a little bit. So that's why as you get into the more advanced levels of athletics, that it becomes a, a little bit more important because a few seconds here or there can make all the difference in the world, as I'm sure you know you you folks are quite familiar with. And you know what's the difference between first and second, or you know being on the podium or not? A few seconds can make a really big difference. So that's nutrient timing. Get ninety percent of your diet success right there. So you're pretty much all the way there if you can master those three. Yeah, before we jump over to questions, I want to give you kind of this last piece here to talk about um, the the thing you guys I see all the time, consistency over perfection, right? You have it on t-shirts, you talk about it in multiple podcasts, videos, all that stuff. I think it's such a, um, a, a key factor in like body composition changes that people lose sight of, right? Um, in the idea that like they have to be perfect with their calories, with their macros, with their timing, the composition and the supplements and like ultimately when you try to go down that road you tend to fail more frequently because you burn out right and so talk to me talk a little bit about like consistency over perfection what that means for for you guys at rp and and why you preach that so so much trying to be perfect takes a really big psychological toll on people and in nutrition especially i mean in life i would say in general you literally can't be perfect. Nutrition, nutrition labels are inherently a little bit off here and there. So if you wanted to be perfect, you still could not ever be perfect. So we just always like to say, rather than like stressing yourself out and worrying yourself so much about that little extra tiny little bit at the end, 
it's just not worth it in the grand scheme of things because people get so caught up on that. They get burnt out. We've just seen it so many times where someone will be so committed to like a fat loss diet for eight or 12 weeks. And then when they reach that end point, like they're done. They'll just kind of go off the rails or they just won't have the mental energy to get back into it. And that's when you'd want to maintain all those results. And so if you can, you know, on a scale of one to 10, right? Like an RPE scale, if you would push yourself to like an eight and a half or a nine and save a little bit in the tank, you're probably much more likely to be sustainable and to keep those results going rather than pushing yourself all the way to the 10 to that max. And then you're like, you know what, you know, screw this nutrition thing. Like I'm done. I need a break. That's what you really don't want to hit. And that's what you don't want to have happen. And that to me was a pretty big lesson that took me a while to learn over time. And I think that's a lot of just like the art of coaching. Because it takes some experience of working with folks and, you know, making some mistakes with with clients. And after a while, you, you just start to catch on. You're like, oh, okay. Because I one story that stands out to me, I always like to tell this one, is uh, I had a, a girl who was consistently placing like top three in the world in CrossFit. And I finally got the chance to work with her. And I was so excited. Like I wrote I swear the most perfect diet you could ever imagine. It was time like down to the minute she was training like three times a day. I was so excited. I was like, I probably, you know, hurt my shoulder, pat myself on the back because I thought it was so good. And then I sent it to her. And then like, I never heard anything from her. And I would keep, keep reaching out. And I was like, hey, like, what's going on? What can I change? Like, give me some feedback. And it just, it was like so intense that she never, she never had a chance to stick with it because I think she was also in the middle of moving like between cu- countries and all this stuff. So she had a lot of stress going on in her life, but long story short, she just never stuck with it. And I didn't realize at the time why that was. And then like, I started to make that mistake uh, later on with uh, Rich Froning because he wanted to do some like intermittent fasting. And I was like, no, 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 like, don't do that. It's not, I was like, it's not hundred percent perfect. It's not optimized. And he was like, he was like, hey man, like this just makes my life a little bit easier. And I was like, okay, okay. Let's nail your calories. Let's nail your macronutrients. Let's get all that right. Okay, it's not going to be 100% perfect, but guess what? It might be 90% perfect. And then he was, he was always sick with it for like three years. And I was like, oh, okay. That's kind of what I would say, looking back in retrospect, that's more the art of coaching versus, you know, all, you can you know do all the best science in the world and really try to optimize things. But if people don't stick with it, it really doesn't matter. You, know, you can have the best plan in the world, but if no one sticks with it, then it's not the best plan in the world. <laughs> the easiest way to describe that. So that to me is consistency is more important than perfection. Focus on being very good you know, instead of perfect. Because if you can do very good for years and years and years on end, that's usually how the champions remain. That's good. Um, let's do some questions here and then I'll, we'll wrap up because I want to ask you about the certification process too because I know that's something new that we're involved in and, and want to just kind of pick your brain on that a little bit for everybody. Uh, okay, so do you have an example of uh, how to use uh, the app? I think uh, if you Google just like RP Strength or RP Diet Coach app, there's a lot of like, tutorials people reviewing it like uh people should like it shows kind of like how to use the app on there um and then i'll drop a link into the chat here of um where you can download the app we with the nvdm we get a discount on the membership after your trial so if you want to give it a shot um i'll put that in there so you can try that um yeah i'll, I'll add yeah. one thing to that so the uh the diet app will work great for probably about 99 percent of people if you're one of the folks that's doing the really long hard workouts you know past like three four or five hours it's not optimized for that i think the max you can go up to in the app is four hours um and it's probably not going to have the carbohydrates high enough um alex harrison uh so one of our coaches again i probably don't need to intro him too much because it sounds like you guys are very familiar with him but he actually just came out with his own app um is it okay if i mention that i don't don't, don't want to step on any toes or anything yeah no no, it's good we've we've talked about it the saturday morning app yeah okay cool so like that is designed specifically just for longer endurance workouts and that's going to tell you how much fluid how much you know sodium how much carbs all that stuff exactly how much you need for those longer ones um, that's probably a good tool in addition if you have those really long workouts because our app is not optimized for that. 
Yeah, it's a it's a great app. I'll I'll see if I can find a link here as we continue because uh, it's uh, it'll help you build out specifically for those like long workouts too. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about one on one coaching here at the end that I think can alleviate some of those issues as well if you're doing some of the longer workouts. So uh, next question was, is it good or bad to maintain your weight year round, or would you recommend like gaining weight, losing weight, kind of going through that like yo yo uh, up and down? I think this is actually a really good question because I think people struggle with this. Yeah, it is a really good question. I think it depends on what is the ultimate outcome that someone's trying to get to. And I think in athletics, again, being an endurance athlete, like, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I'm probably on the right track here, that uh, you don't want to be too heavy for endurance sports, right? Like, I've been that heavy runner before, and I'm just like, why Why do I weigh like 165 and I'm running against guys who weigh, you know, one. 35, 145. And who knows, maybe even smaller than that, but like you just put yourself at a disadvantage. So I think there's nothing wrong with just maintaining your weight year round, especially if you're already at a good weight. Now, what comes into a little bit more effect perhaps would be if you're trying to change that body composition, like maybe you're just a little bit too heavy or not quite at the right body composition, you know, the right body fat percentage, then you could start to do some of the, the periodized cycles where you maybe do a little, like a little cut or something. But on that note, like just make sure that you do all that stuff as far away from your uh, competitive season as possible, because you don't want to be cutting calories or anything like that when you're close to um, like a, a big race get it done in the off season. Yeah, that's great. This can actually I, leads perfectly into our next question too. Can I speak? Uh, yeah, I, go for it. Go for and it. I think what Simon might be asking, because I have seen this before. So professional triathletes, what Simon is, they get really lean through the season. And then at the end of the season, like you see people say, hey, you should probably gain a little bit of weight to just recover the body before getting back into training for the season. So I think that could be his question. Can you speak to that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I think that's actually, that's a really good idea. Um, I'm going to, because I know bodybuilding a little bit more, so just hang in there with me real quick. I know that it's going to seem crazy, but that's exactly what bodybuilders do too. Like you get so lean, it's not, it's not sustainable. So you're not really doing like a maintenance phase after that. Yet you're actually doing an intentional rebound because you have to get back up to a sustainable level. So if you're, you know, 5% when you're competing, let's say that's, and that's really, really lean you probably need to come back up a little bit. So you're in that, you know, eight range or something like that. Cause that's probably a little bit more sustainable. That's still very lean, by the way, you know, maybe it's more like eight to 10, but that's probably much more sustainable and realistic for most people. Were you saying 5% for a physique level athlete or. I don't, I don't know how lean. Yeah. Um, I would say probably if you're under 10%, uh, body fat, uh, you probably want to, that's probably pretty close because 5% is super lean, uh, Crazy. like on yeah. stage type of lean. Yes. So yeah. if you're, if you're an endurance athlete trying to be 5%, that's probably a little, a little yeah. too lean. Yeah, correct. No, again, thank you. That's yeah. 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 So I would say, yeah, to, to kind of bring that back to endurance, I would say if you're somebody who is competitive and probably dips maybe into that sub 10% range. So maybe you're sitting seven, 8%, like during the season to, to optimize, like for weight power to weight ratio and stuff like that. And then potentially in that off season, it gives you a chance to maybe come back up to 10%, maybe even just a little above 10% to kind of help recover and stuff like that. So. Perfect. Yep. Yep. That sounds great. Uh, this one, well, then the next question was, how do you know when you're at a healthy weight? Um, performance is very good. And you don't have any like health issues because on the female side, if you get too lean, too light, you can start to have some of those issues. That's probably not a good idea. Um, you start to get too low in body fat percentage for females. They can start to mess with you know some, some hormonal stuff. So probably don't want to go too much below that. Um, you you want to stay more in that. So I guess if we extrapolate that, so we say because. I mean, 15% for a female is super incredibly lean. Yeah. So if you're like 18, that's probably a pretty good spot, I would say. Yeah, again, you know, Natasha, please hop in if, if, you, if you think otherwise. But um, that's probably a pretty good spot, I would say. Yeah, and then part of that too is like knowing you're at a healthy weight. If you can get a um, maybe like a DEXA or something like that to really dial in like uh, where your body fat percentage is, I think that can help too um, to know like, you know, if you have a little bit left to give, especially if you're on the line, right? Like if you're somebody who's carrying that 
you know, close to 10% as a male or, you know, in between 15 and 20% as a female, then like, you probably want to know kind of more dialed in where you're at specifically. So you're not dipping into that kind of range that can be uh, detrimental in the long run. I'll, I'll also just speak to that. Um, and you mentioned it, Nick, in the very first sentence, you said performance. And I know for myself, I went through different phases where I tried to lose weight and I got to what I thought was the perfect weight for me, but I noticed the strength drop off, especially on the bike. And then, and, and, it, and it was a lot of hard work to get down to that weight. And then I mm-hmm. added a couple of pounds and then I found my strength came back and the performance was all there. I didn't lose anything else. And I felt better just overall. I was recovering better for workouts. So I think really paying attention, uh, again, correct me if I'm wrong, to just how do you feel and how are you yeah. performing? Weigh that out and you'll know what the best performance is for you. And it, it may just take experimenting with it. So, Cap, next, next 100%. question. 100%. <laughs> yeah. So this next one, I think you kind of touched on a little bit, but um, it, it says, what is and how important is calorie balance when you're uh, trained through a fitness block? There's clearly a trade-off here, weight target versus fitness goal. Um, would you not think calorie balance should take a back seat? And you kind of mentioned this, like depending on where you are in your season, right? So, um, you know, I think if you're, there's there's levers that you can pull on and right and so like if you're if you're in a caloric deficit then obviously you're going to suffer performance issues right and then conversely if you're at maintenance or even in a, maybe a little bit of a surplus then performance can actually you know increase so i think that's maybe the question here is what you know how important is that balance through different phases of training throughout the season yeah, yeah, totally. I wouldn't say necessarily calorie balance takes a backseat because it would just be changing the calorie levels around. So if you decide in your off season, you're like, hey, you know what? Truthfully, I probably am like five, 10 pounds, just a little bit too heavy. So you would start to work that caloric deficit to get yourself down to where you want to go. But when you get to a phase, right? So periodization is all about manipulating variables to get the best results in you know future phases. And so you would do that because your weakness is let's say being a little bit too heavy and man, it's hard when you're a little bit heavy on the bike or when you're running. So you get down to where you need to go. Then you start to slowly increase your calories back up. You really get those carbs going again. Now, now trade off. Now the, the main focus is all on performance. And so you raise those calories back up to where you need to be. So you can perform at a better you know, your optimal level, so to speak. So it's not that necessarily they, they take a backseat. It's just how you manipulate them. And, and Mike, I think the different levers, you're just pulling different, different levers and there's always trade-offs. So if you are in a deficit, you know, performance is maybe going to dip a little bit. That being said, if someone is truly a little bit too heavy, that might not be the case because they see that as they go down a little bit in body weight, they feel a little bit better. Again, it's all trade-offs. And it depends on the person. Like if that person's already on the leaner side and they do that, almost certainly. Because now, like you said, I mean, if you start getting down 7 8% body fat, to get lower is you're going to see some performance suffer. You know, and again, like I know bodybuilding uh, well. And like when you get down to those levels, you're not doing it because you want to perform really well. Like you're doing it because, you know. You're, you're trying to get on stage. And, and so like, there are those trade-offs. So at that point for that individual being that low, it would make sense for them to manipulate their calories, to come back up, to focus more on performance. So um, let me know if that makes sense. If yeah. that's, uh, I, I was going to say, it's probably, uh, we would say it's highly inadvisable to maybe try to cut weight in like the last four to five weeks before an Ironman. Um, that should probably not be the time that you're searching for those last couple pounds to come off, uh, probably need to focus on pushing the nutrition, pushing the work, you know, especially intra workout. Cause again, we, you're doing four or five, six hour bike rides, yes. not the try, not the time to try to diet, uh, when you're doing some of those things. That's the time when you're probably stuffing your face with as many carbohydrates as you can. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's we're a little over time here, but I do want to wrap up with this. Cause I think this is important. Um, the, you kind of talked about RP and like the journey and everything, right. And recently you guys announced the, uh, the certification uh, nutrition certification course. I did that in the fall. Um, I, I went through it. It was amazing. And I said, Hey, if we're going to do this from an NVDM side, if we're going to provide nutrition coaching, then we need to work with RP to get our coaches certified through them to make sure that we all know what we're talking about. So 
Talked a little bit about one-on-one -on -one coaching through RP. We're currently in the process of getting uh, a, a number of our coaches certified through RP to, to go through uh, that process and, and be able to offer one-on-one -on -one nutrition coaching. So how did like, why was that a thing that you guys wanted to do? Um, and, and yeah, just talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So the, the, the clear trend and direction that I think just athletics online is going and that more and more people are doing and becoming online coaches, which, you know, Hey, that's, that's cool. Right. That if you, if you can and have the means then awesome, especially if it's a, a passion and something you want to do. The only downside and trade-off would be is that people don't really know what they're doing and what they're talking about. And so people tend to look for us for, for some of that. And we thought, well, like having a certification program is probably a pretty good step. And there, you know, there's, there's a number of them out there. Um, yeah, I would, I would like to think precision nutrition is probably the most known one, but from sort of what I hear and gather again, it's a phenomenal uh, certification program, but maybe they lack a little bit of like the art of coaching. And that's a little bit more of what we, what I would hate to hear from feedback probably my my biggest fear would be that people take it and they're like oh well like I didn't really learn on how to like actually coach people because to learn nutrition basics it's going to be the same with us or with another certification program like you can't really change that right like a gram of protein is always going to be four calories you know same with you know fat's going to be nine calories carbs four none of that's going to change but where, where we really want to put our main point of emphasis was how do you actually coach people how do you interact with people what do you do in certain situations and so like you get enough case studies, you get enough, all the knowledge that you learn that when you're done, Nick, you will feel very confident that you can coach people on your nutrition. It's really uh, as practical as possible. It's the best way that I could describe it. Mike, does that fit with your experience with it? Yeah, I would say uh, for me, like when I went into it, having a little bit of nutrition background uh, from what I've learned over the years, the the biggest step that I took was like being confident in the fact that like, I felt like I could probably write a diet for myself, but like I never felt confident enough to do it for anybody else until I went through that process. And even in the in the certification, like there's four or five modules where you essentially have to write template diets uh, for, you know, clients, like fake clients or whatever, and kind of go through that process. And and then you get to look, review and see, okay, here's how an RP coach actually wrote the diet, right? And you can kind of compare notes and like what what was different that I did that maybe what they did and you kind of explain and stuff like that. So. Uh, for us, I mean, when Natasha and I started talking about this, you know, oh man, almost a year ago, it was, we kept running into the same problem, right? With, with endurance athletes, it's tough because there's such a training component to it, right? And so uh, outsourcing that nutrition to another coach was always difficult because we're, they don't really yeah. communicate, right? And so to be able to have our coaches, mm -hmm. you know, go through the process and learn the art of nutrition coaching as well as like the basic understanding of nutrition was important for us so that we can bring it all back into uh, one coach, one singular coach who can yeah. pull the different levers, right. And do training and nutrition and his understanding that all of that affects one another. So uh, trying to bring it all in house was, was the biggest thing for us. Love it. That's great. I would say the one word if I had in, I promise I didn't tell him to say this beforehand, but the main word that I would say with taking the stirs confidence you can be confident in that you'll, you'll know what you're doing. And um, real, real quick um, side story is uh, my buddy, Mike and I did a podcast talking about like um, the early days of RP not too long ago. And so it reminded me of this, but the first time I ever wrote a diet for a paying customer, I just, I gave her away too much food because I was like, I, 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 I think this is right, but I just, I, I'm not confident in, in, in that it is correct. And so I ended up giving her more food and she was like, oh my gosh, this is like way too much food. And it's just, it, it stands out to me as, as something funny. You know, Mike, you might appreciate this, but I want to say like every meal she had had like two servings of fat. And it's just like, just, this was back in, you know, I don't know, 2010, maybe something like that. So again, if there, we, there was nothing around like that, you know, or at least I don't think there was in 2010. So it's like, rather than make those mistakes yourself, you can go through something like this where you learn all that. You don't have to make those mistakes. You can listen to me talk about all the stupid mistakes I made. Then you don't have to make the same mistakes. I'm sure, you know, Natasha is like, I don't know, when you first started coaching, like, I'm sure what you do now is a lot better than, you, you know, you did back then. Like, that's just kind of how it goes. So if you can learn from people that have already done it, it just makes the process a lot better. Yeah, the, the other tool too that I think we're excited to utilize is the RP Strength Diet app too. I think uh, being able to leverage that app with some clients and 
um, you know, coach them through that app so that I think the ultimate goal, you know, at least for me personally, is like, if I'm going to coach a nutrition client, I want them to learn and again, gain that confidence, you know, so that down the road, if they want to, they can do it on their own. I think as coaches, like inherently, that's our goal uh, all the time is to like teach and help athletes grow so that if any point you feel like you're ready to take the step and, and do it on your own that you can right now, obviously we're always willing to like stay with you. And some people want that, you know, from a, uh, adherence perspective or just guidance. Right. I mean, I personally would never coach myself, uh, cause I understand the value of coaching, but again, I feel like I have the knowledge to do it if I, if I wanted to. So that's, that's, I think our ultimate goal with this is to just help people understand the scientific way that you can go about, you know, uh, nutrition and diet and and all those things along with training. So, yeah, actually I have a version on my phone right now that uh, allows people to do custom macros. So we're kind of hopefully getting that out before, I don't know, summerish end of summer, something like that, but trying to work out all the little kinks uh, ahead of time. Awesome. Nick, Mike, I really appreciate you guys uh, tonight. Nick, thank you so much for, uh, just partnering with us in this endeavor and uh, bringing this education to our athletes. I think it's going to be a massive benefit. I don't think our athletes honestly can succeed at the level they, they should be without really taking care of the nutrition components. So I feel like yeah. really help folks in the future. Cool. Yeah. You know, thanks so much for, for having me on uh, folks. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out anytime. Um, if there are more general nutrition stuff, I'm, I'm happy to help. If it's a bit beyond my scope, very particular on the endurance side, Alex Harrison's probably a great resource. So sounds like he's coming on in a few weeks anyways. So you're, you're probably all set, but you know, please reach out anytime. If you, if you do have questions, more than happy to help. Awesome. Mike, did you want to say anything? No, that's good. Just, Hey, thanks for hopping on, Nick. I appreciate it. Like I said, at the beginning, if you would have told me three, four years ago that we'd have you on a team call, it would have been like, uh, no chance, but, uh, here we are. So crazy world we live in. Yeah, no, it's awesome. No, seriously, we appreciate you guys. So, you know, like I said, any, any questions or anything about, especially if some folks, some folks are taking a cert, sure, you know, reach out if you have any questions, we're, we're happy to help and you know, join the RP Academy group too. It's a, I think pretty good spot. Awesome. Guys, thank you so much for joining us. Hope you have a good rest of your Easter. And uh, unfortunately, Masters, I say go back to the Masters, but Masters is over now. So, um, But yeah, thank you for joining us and we'll see you guys next week. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Nick.